Hi everyone, I'm Shweta. I'm going to be talking about preventing pollution attacks in multi-source network coding. And uh, this is joint work with Dan Bonnet, Xavier Boyan, and David Freeman. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, we first see a quick introduction to network coding. Of course, we, we just already saw that, but for completeness, I'll do a quick review. Then we look at pollution attacks. We look at the security challenges that come up in multi-source networks uh, as against single-source networks that we just saw. In particular, we're going to look at insider attacks in multi-source networks. So in a network where there are multiple senders, uh, there, is, there is a new very real threat of uh, senders wanting to frame one another. And uh, these are realistic threats that come up in applications like BitTorrent. And we'll, we'll look at how these attacks are modeled and how they can be prevented. Uh, so having examined these attacks, we'll prevent a solution which has a matching lower bound. So moving on, uh, this is a brief schematic that illustrates the idea of network coding that we just saw. You have a user, Alice, and she wants to send two bits B1 and B2 to these two receivers here. And uh, you can see the network shown in the figure. She has a distinct path uh, to, each, to each sender that does not share any edges. And she has a second path with each, uh, with each receiver that, that shares this edge, uh, R3, R4. So clearly, if she only, if she only sends uh, either B1 or B2 down, down this path, then uh, she needs at least two cycles to communicate both bits to both receivers. However, if uh, the router R3 sends an XOR of the bits B1 and B2 down, uh, down this edge, then each receiver receives bit BI on, on its uh, distinct path and can recover the other bit by, uh, from the XOR that it also receives. So uh, this nice intuition lends itself to, uh, secu uh, uh, to proofs. And it turns out that uh, network coding is provably useful. It achieves capacity in many networks. It also has other applications in wireless communication, data storage, uh, and so on. Let's look quickly at how uh, network coding is implemented. So here, again, uh, you see the user, Alice. And she has this file uh, that she wants to transmit over the network. We'll say that uh, this file has an identifier, uh, ID1. So think, think of identifier as file name, for example. So say that she breaks her file into a, a, bunch, of, uh, a bunch of orthogonal vectors, U, V, and W. And each packet that is uh, sent across the network is, is this data followed by the file identifier, followed by a unit vector with a 1 in the ith position. So what does she do to send this information uh, down the network? She takes random linear combinations. So she picks uh, random coding coefficients a, b, and c from the underlying field. And then she just takes a linear combination uh, of, the, of the data to get this, this new aggregate vector, as we shall call it. And because of this uh, identity matrix that you get, so if you stack these vectors up, uh, you can see how you get an identity matrix. And because of these unit vectors, uh, the coding coefficients are, are maintained in the aggregate packet. So that's what the sender does. And what does, uh, what does the router in the network do? So similarly, similar to the sender, the router receives two data packets. These could already be aggregate packets, so they have uh, non-unit augmentation coefficients. And the router uh, again picks some random coefficients given by k and j in this case, and takes a random linear combination of, of the incoming packets and transmits this out. Um, and because we kept track of, of the coding coefficients in the, in the augmentation component, it's clear that the receiver can uh, recover the original vectors that were sent just by inverting the, inverting the matrix uh, that's formed by stacking the augmentation vectors together. So, so far, uh, we've seen how network coding is useful and, 
and how, how it's, it's simple to implement. But we also so far have assumed that all nodes are honest, which is obviously not a realistic assumption. And in, in this setting, there are old challenges of security, like data integrity and authentication, which uh, follow from, from the traditional world of networking and cryptography. But there's also the new challenge that we already looked at uh, in the previous talk. There is the pollution problem. And in particular, the, the takeaway is that standard methods do not apply. So that there are standard methods of signatures and Macs that are used to address these problems. But in the setting of network coding, the, these methods do not directly apply. So, they, so we need to develop new mechanisms to address the security problems. So let's look briefly at the pollution problem. So here we see uh, Alice, and again, uh, there's a network, and she wants to transmit data to two receivers. So now in this setting, we assume that the node R1 has been compromised. So uh, a malicious user controls, uh, controls the router R1. So Alice, as usual, uh, chooses a file that she wants to send that she breaks into a set of vectors. She takes linear combinations of these vectors and sends them out on every edge. But now, because the node R1 is malicious, uh, instead of forwarding a, a legitimate packet, it forwards, it forwards some uh, bad data. And you can see how every node downstream from the malicious node is going to use this bad data to mix all its, its packets with. So very quickly, just one bad packet can pollute the whole network, and the receivers, sure enough, cannot uh, recover the, the messages correctly. So if you think about it, in, this, uh, in the setting of network coding, what do we want in order to achieve security? What we want is the notion of hop-by-hop -hop containment. So what this means is that uh, even if a malicious user does inject a bad packet into the network, it should not be able to traverse more than one hop. So even if I do inject a bad packet, the very next node that receives the packet should be able to detect it as, as uh, bad and drop it. And this will prevent it from mixing with the good data in the rest of the network and from polluting the network. So in particular, what you want is that any router in the network, when it receives a combination of packets, it's faced with this question of whether this aggregate packet it received, whether it's valid or not, and whether it should forward this packet or whether it should discard this packet. And this problem for, has been addressed for uh, the case of single source networks. Solutions can be either information theoretic or cryptographic. Uh, we'll focus on the cryptographic uh, solutions. So uh, cryptographic solutions have been either subspace signatures or message auth authentication codes. We just saw uh, another nice new uh, subspace signature scheme. But all these solutions, all these solutions only address the case of single source networks. And as we shall see, uh, carrying forward these solutions from single to multi-source networks is not entirely straight. It's not straightforward. And we'll see uh, that there are new threats in the multi-source model. And we'll look at how those threats can be addressed. So let's look at uh, multiple sources in network coding. So uh, this is just, the, just pure network coding when there are multiple sources. We'll look at the security aspect in the next few slides. But here we just have two senders, and uh, they have two files to send. For simplicity, in this setting, I'm assuming that every file comprises of a single vector. So it's a one-dimensional subspace for every sender. So now I have uh, the first user who has a vector u, a file ID, ID1, and the augmentation component of 1. The augmentation uh, component having only one bit implies that it's a sing it's a, there's only one vector in the subspace. And similarly, for the second sender, you have, a, a, you have data vector v, a different file identifier id2, and the augmentation component. So how do we mix these data packets together, given that they come from different files? 
the idea is, is uh, fairly straightforward. All that we really need to do is a sort of uniformization of uh, the vectors. So here we can see how we've added an extra augmentation uh, augmentation bit for for each of the vectors, and we've uniformized the uh, the file identifiers so that both of them now have the same the same sequence of file IDs. And now these uh, packets are amenable to mixing, just as in the single source case. Uh, it helps to think of the multi-source case as uh, having a super source that is transmitting all the packets to all, all the different sources, and it's really the same problem. So it's the same idea. Uh, there's just more bookkeeping to do when you want to do multi-source network coding. However, as However, as I alluded to earlier, the security in such a setting is a much harder problem. So in particular, users can frame one another. So in, in a network, when you have multiple senders, and each sender is a legitimate uh, user of the system and has a private key and a public key pair, you now have the threat that one, one sender can frame another sender. And by that I mean that uh, a sender can make the, the, a malicious sender can make the honest sender look as though it sent some data that it did, did not in fact send. And we'll see, we'll see how this can happen. So in this work we show an impossibility result. Uh, if, if we naturally extend the, the signature schemes and the security model from the single source setting, we show that pollution attacks in that setting cannot be prevented. It's impossible. And in fact, uh, we al also show that this natural extension forces the receiver to solve the clique problem in order to decode. Like I said, we'll, we'll show a general attack on any scheme. So let's look at what a signature scheme in the multi-source setting might look like, uh, a natural generalization of the single source setting. It would comprise four algorithms as before. The first is setup, uh, which takes the security parameter and the dimension of the subspace under consideration and outputs a public-private key pair and the, the field modulus P. The vectors to be signed live in FP to the N. And then uh, we have the sign algorithm that would take in the secret key, the file identifier, and the vector, and output a signature sigma. So remember that the file identifier is what binds all the vec all vectors to a given file. And to sign a vector space, you would it, a vector space represents a file. So to sign a vector space, you would choose a file identifier and sign all its basis vectors using this algorithm. The verify algorithm would take the public key, the file identifier, an aggregate vector, and a signature and output true or false depending on whether that vector lives, lives in the correct subspace or not. And the combined algorithm uh, is really an artifact of network coding because you're combining uh, the data. You also need a combined algorithm to combine signatures. So the combined algorithm would take uh, these random coding coefficients A and B using which you're combining the data and signatures uh, sigma and tau of, of the original vectors and produce a new signature gamma, such that if sigma is a signature for V and tau is a signature for W, then gamma is a signature for a, a V plus B W. So now we'll see how uh, this, the definition of the signature scheme that we saw can be attacked. And since we've made no assumptions on the specifics of the scheme itself, we're only considering the definition and the functionality of the scheme, you, you see that this attack is very general and very real. So what happens here? So you have a sender, Alice, and she wants to transmit some files. And now you have a malicious user uh, who we refer to as Melee. So Melee wants to frame Alice. In particular, what he wants to do is that he wants the receiver to think that uh, Alice sent, sent some information that she did not, in fact, send. So how does he do this? So what he, what he does is he sends different files 
with the same file identifier. So this is clearly uh, not, not allowed in the protocol of the system because each file needs to have its own unique identifier. But the problem is that every user is choosing his own file identifier and there is no way in, in this uh, system to bind, to force the user to be honest about this. So let's see how he can use this. So he creates uh, two vectors that he uh, wants to send into the network. So let's, let's uh, see, there's V and there's W. Now these are again uh, two separate files and they should have two distinct file identifiers. But as I mentioned already, uh, he's going to cheat and he's going to use the same file identifier for, for both vectors, for both files. And let's say that each uh, vector has a signature sigma and a signature tau. Now Alice has uh, her own file that she wants to send. Uh, the data is vector u and the file identifier is id1. So what does Malle do? First, he combines these two packets as they would be combined in the network and he gets this new packet. So this is a very, this is a legitimate operation in network coding. He takes a linear combination of the two packets and he gets uh, a new packet with id1, id2. Uh, this is the augmentation and this is the new signature which he obtains say just by uh, appending the old signatures. And uh, along, along with this aggregate packet and the other packet that he had created by reusing the file ID, these two packets are sent to the receiver. Now, when the receiver decodes, what does it find? The receiver, the receiver decodes uh, that Mele sent the vector W because that's what he uh, received in this packet and he associates that vector with identifier ID2. And in order to recover what Alice sent, uh, he, he subtracts W from U plus V and he, he thinks that Alice sent vector U plus V minus W, which is clearly false because Alice sent uh, the vector U, not, not this new vector. So as we saw, uh, by allowing a user to have, to choose its own, uh, own file identifiers, there is no way to prevent a malicious user from reusing a file identifier across different files. And this can allow, allow the user to mount a very simple but very powerful attack in, in a practical scenario. So the natural question is whether there's a way out of this. And uh, it turns out luckily that there is. If, if, we, if, we, uh, if we prevent the file identifiers from being arbitrary, but instead force them to be cryptographically verifiable. That is, if we have the sign algorithm generate the file identifier instead of the user picking it and inputting it to the sign algorithm, it turns out that this attack can be thwarted. So uh, for all vectors uh, V of a given file, we want a verify algorithm that will take the vector V and the file identifier and output uh, an output true if the vector belongs to the file. And it should be hard to construct a vector y outside a subspace such that it verifies against the identifier of that subspace. So these, these requirements are reminiscent. And uh, indeed, it turns out that uh, these requirements imply that the file identifier itself needs to be a vector space signature. And this is shown formally in the paper. So let's look, let's look at the new scheme that we now have. So instead of the user picking arbitrary file IDs and providing, is that, providing it as input to the sign algorithm, we now have that the sign algorithm generates the file identifier for every file. And every router that receives an aggregate vector which has uh, some data and, and a file identifier component can now verify uh, the data against the file ID. And uh, we, we have a verify algorithm that we saw in the previous slide that will only pass the, uh, the aggregate vector as valid if indeed it, was, it belongs to the subspace identified by the ID that it carries. 
this clearly thwarts the previous attack. And it turns out that we can uh, generalize the, uh, the bound from BFKW09 on vector space signatures to get a bound uh, for file identifiers. And we, we have a scheme that matches this bound. So in our work, we propose uh, a security model for multi-source networks, which captures the, the notion of insider attacks. We generalize the scheme from uh, BFKW09, it, it, this is a typo, for multi-source settings. And uh, this is a simple generalization of, of uh, their work, which achieves the lower bound. In particular, I'd like to talk about uh, a new primitive that we propose uh, in the paper uh, that, that captures the requirements of, of multi-source network coding settings, and uh, we call that a vector hash. So this comprises three algorithms, uh, the hash setup algorithm, which takes the security parameter and the uh, subspace dimension, and outputs some public parameters. The hash algorithm that takes the public parameters and a vector and out, outputs a hash of the vector. And the test algorithm that takes, that takes uh, a vector y, an aggregate vector, a set of coefficients given by this vector a here, and a set of hashes, and outputs true or false. So here h is a vector of hashes of the basis vectors of the file, v1 through vm. And test returns true if and only if Y was constructed as sigma AIVI, where AI uh, are the components of this vector A. So you can see that you can see how this captures what we require for a file identifier. This is exactly what we need. We need a hash of a vector space such that uh, every node in the network that receives an aggregate vector and receives this. Uh, Vector, vector space hash, which we call the file identifier, it's able to, to use this test algorithm uh, to check whether the aggregate vector it received was indeed generated in the correct way. And uh, if, it, if it passes the test, then it uh, uses, uses that packet for linear combinations and forwards it to other nodes in the network. If, if it does not, then it discards the packet, and we, we have hop-by-hop -hop containment, even in multi-source networks. So this, this vector hash can be uh, instantiated using ideas from uh, BFKW09, as we saw, and uh, it implies multi-source network coding signatures. So in conclusion, uh, we discussed security challenges in multi-source network coding. In particular, we saw a generic attack for uh, user-chosen file identifiers. We constructed cryptographically verifiable file identifiers in order to thwart that attack. And we proposed a new primitive uh, called vector hash, which we instantiated using ideas from uh, BFKW09. And uh, this construction matches the lower bound. So that's the end of the talk. Any questions to Shweta? So I, I'm not sure I completely followed. So are you asking if confidentiality is also a challenge in network coding? Uh, my problem is that is the confidentiality is also a security challenge in network coding. So, uh, yeah, so net, network coding can, can just be thought of as a new way to do routing. But, uh, you know, information is still information, and you, you want to have that information secure. So all the previous security challenges apply. So confidentiality is also something desirable in network coding, but it's more easily achieved in network coding because, uh, 
the plain text is it does it does not get past the first hop in the network. It pretty soon gets mixed with other data, and uh, you know the plain the plain text message is not not out in the open. So in that sense. Time for one more question. So what's this exact difference between the hash function and the signature? Is there a particular difference? The particular difference is that uh, there's no secret key associated with a hash function. There's no key pair associated with it. So even if the hash function is collision resistant, um, there's no authentication associated with it. Okay, so let's thank Shweta.